third Sunday after Easter that I, I, I think of this, this season of Easter kind of like the, the 40 days that Jesus appeared uh, to his disciples af- after Easter. Why did he do that? He physically showed himself to the women at the tomb, the, uh, the disciples uh, up, in, up uh, by the Sea of Galilee as well. And it's, and it's to give us the comfort, the security of, of knowing that he did. Uh, rise from the grave, that the tomb is empty from, from Easter Sunday. And so uh, we continue to be reminded of that as well. And when we get to meditation, sermon meditation, uh, that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about, the security, um, the, the good news, knowing that he has indeed risen from that tomb. So let's get started with our worship this morning. One thing that's going to be a little change, uh, when we sing the psalm responsibly, I'm going to ask you to grab a hymnal, but I'll, I'll tell you that there's, uh, some of the markings are missing in the, the printed in the hymnal, so we're going to have to follow along in the hymnal, but we'll, we'll get there when eventually. But let's get started with our, our service this morning. Would you grab a hymnal? We'll sing hymn 250, just verse 1 at this time. Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of our praise.
not printed this way in the bulletin, but would you join with me and let's pray together our prayer of the day there. It's on page 5 of your service folder. Let us pray. O risen Lord, you saved sinful mankind from the despair of sin and death by the humiliation, suffering, and death of your Son. Now, through the power and joy of his resurrection, give peace, hope, and happiness, not only to us, but to all your faithful children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. During the Easter season, um, th throughout the church here, there's, right, remember the, the following the pericope, we usually have three readings, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament epistles, and the other one from the Gospels. And if we kept on following that formula throughout the church here, there's a book of the Bible that we would never hit. We would never hit the New Testament book of Acts. And so through the Easter season, uh, we replace an Old Testament reading with uh, a reading from the book of Acts, which tells us, teaches us about the history of the New Testament church basically after Jesus ascended into heaven. And when we think about the follow-up, the follow-up to Easter here, Acts chapter 12, after Jesus ascended into heaven, don't we see a, a drastic change in the attitude, uh, in, in, in the mindset of the disciples that before, for the three years that they were with Jesus during that holy week, we see their weakness, we see them running away, we see their weak faith, but now they are faithfully carrying out Jesus' command to preach the gospel. And here we have a part of that story, a, 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 a miracle of Peter's uh, escape from pit prison in Acts chapter 12, uh, being arrested and thrown into prison for being faithful to Jesus and carrying out his command to preach. So we read from Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. This is very, very few months after Pentecost, right? Remember Pentecost, the, the flames of fire, and the disciples at Pentecost in Jerusalem. This is six months, maybe at the most, after Pentecost that, that Peter uh, is, is doing this preaching. Verse 2, He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door! You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. 
Tell James and the brothers about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. That's the end of our first scripture lesson. This is where we get to our psalm for this morning. We're going to be singing the psalm, Psalm 118, responsively between congregation you and myself. This is where I would suggest to grab a hymnal, turn to page 108 in the front section of that hymnal, uh, and there are markings there for, for us to sing that responsively. So Alicia will play through the, the melodies for us to get our, our brains familiar with the, the melody, and we'll sing Psalm 118 responsively. The Lord is my strength and my song. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. I will not die but live. I will give you thanks for you answered me. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. This is the day the Lord has made. Our second scripture lesson this third Sunday after Easter comes from Paul's second letter to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth, chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, and we read a little bit into chapter 3 as well. That in this section, Paul is defending his ministry. You, you can imagine, think, think, 
The Greeks, back in the, the you know, 2,000 years ago, were very logical thinkers. Plato, Socrates, all that logical way of thinking. And then along comes this, this New Testament apostle missionary teaching and preaching something very illogical, the grace of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul is talking about the competency of his ministry as well as the authority. Paul is telling them, this isn't, this isn't necessarily my idea. I have this command to preach from God Almighty. And it's important to understand this because part of that, that illogical truth of the gospel is a, the contrast between law and gospel. You look at the end there, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not the, not the letter, but the spirit. He's talking about the contrast between the law, the letter that talks about sin and damnation, and then the, the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, creates saving faith, the gospel. So he's talking about this contrast between law and gospel, damnation law, salvation through the gospel. We read 2 Corinthians chapter, chapters uh, 2 and 3, to, uh, sections from chapters 2 and 3. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia, would be Greece. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in, an, in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That's the end of our second scripture lesson this morning. Would you grab a hymnal again? Let's sing our next hymn, hymn 362.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Easter friends, there are always throughout history have been means to give us security, to give us supposed peace and safety from the nasty things of this world. But I would say, if you look back in the last 10, 20 years, I would suggest that there has been an increase of peddling, of advertising to say, buy this so that you can stay secure in your home. Do this in order to strengthen the security in your life. You can watch TV. See all kinds of commercials on there that you put this little gadget by your front door. It's got a camera on there and you can use your smartphone no matter where you are. You can see who's answering or knocking on the door and you can chase that guy away who's about to steal the package that's at your front door. Security is a good thing. I would say going back quite a while to Columbine, Colorado, why is it that we have our schools locked that you go in there and you see the security systems. We don't have, we have a security system across the street there. And why do we have that? To keep the supposed nasty people out of school and keep the children, the faculty, safe. Why is it that you automatically, you get out of the car in the parking lot, whatever store you're at, you hit that button on your key fob of your car, and what happens? The lights go blink, blink, and there's a little beep of the horn, and what happens? All the doors lock. Security, we want to keep things safe. We don't want people stealing the things that we have in the car, in our home. We don't want people hurting ourselves, my family. Security, locked doors are very, very important. You put that on the flip side, though, and say, what's the positive side of all that security? Does it keep, make me feel safe? I put that, that deadbolt, I lock that deadbolt on the door at night and gives me a sense of security, turning on the alarm system, what have you. Makes me feel safe, supposedly. Now put yourselves in the mindset of the apostles, of the disciples, on that first Sunday evening, Easter Sunday evening, this is when the events of our text take place. That we're told very clearly, it's just the Gospels of Luke and John that record for us the events of Jesus appearing to his disciples in the locked room there somewhere in the middle of Jerusalem. That the disciples were afraid. What's going to happen to us? Just look what the Jews, just look what the Romans did to Jesus, the Son of God. If they can do that to Jesus... What's going to stop them from doing that to us? They locked the doors out of fear for what possibly could happen to them. We can understand that. We have those same similar fears and concerns in our daily lives, fears and concerns about this or that. But there are some valuable lessons that we can learn when it comes to these supposed locked doors of Easter that you looked at these locked doors of Easter's, and certainly you see it doesn't remove fears at all. But then when you also look at these locked doors and see how Jesus addressed those locked doors, thankfully, dear friends, isn't it true that those locked doors of Easter certainly do not lock out the joy that is connected with Jesus? So we, we focus our thoughts this morning on Easter's locked doors. Would you follow along in our text this morning, reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, this is, this is the context, the transition between the story of, of Jesus appearing to the Emmaus disciples. Remember those two guys? They weren't necessarily the uh, two of the 12 disciples, 11 disciples, but two followers of Jesus were on their way to the town of Emmaus, Jesus appeared to them, talked to them, taught them, went to their house for supper, and immediately, miraculously left them. And then those two Emmaus disciples found the other followers, the disciples of, of Jesus, and told them. This is what they were talking about. They were still talking about this, the events of the Emmaus disciples. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. 
A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That's our text. So what do you think of, what emotions run through your noggin when you come to church on Easter Sunday morning? Easter Sunday morning, my emotions, my attitude is excitement, happiness, joy. Wake up early in the morning, you hear those birds singing, getting ready for church, for worship, our, our Savior has risen. You humbly think back to Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, all of the humiliating, excruciating things that our Savior endured for the forgiveness of our sins. Easter Sunday, the pinnacle of the church year, I would guess that the emotion of fear is not one of those emotions running through your head. It's not one of the emotions running through my head on Easter Sunday morning. But you look back to that first Easter Sunday morning, and it was not like walking to church, coming into church and seeing the Easter lilies and singing Easter hymns, He is risen. There's all kinds of passages that talk about the fear that was connected not only with the disciples on that first Sunday morning, but the women, the soldiers as well. We read Matthew chapter 28, verse 4. The guards were so afraid of him, the angel that opened up, the, rolled away the stone, that they shook and became like dead men. Those rough and ready Roman soldiers, it doesn't take, takes a whole lot to make a Roman soldier afraid, but Easter Sunday, Roman soldiers were afraid. Mark 16, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid the women. What's going on? We don't understand what's going on. They were afraid. John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood, them, stood among them. This is the same story that we're talking about coming from the Gospel of St. John. The, Jew, the disciples were afraid of the Jews. And then finally, our own text that I just read before, Luke 24, verse 37. They, the disciples, were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Here is Jesus appearing to them. They were frightened. You look at this, and at first it may seem very strange. Easter Sunday morning, all kinds of fear that was going around and all kinds of locked doors, right? You think of the locked doors of the tomb that Herod was trying to lock that door to make sure that that body of Jesus would stay in there. Nobody would steal it. He put his seal on, put those Roman guards there by the tomb doors to make sure that that was secure. The disciples on Easter Sunday locking that door so the Jews couldn't get at them. And even though our circumstances are, are obviously different, we're not in Jerusalem it's 2,000 years later. We don't have Roman soldiers guarding. We don't have Jews chasing after us to, to, to try and, and make trouble for us now. But you think about circumstances in our lives. Aren't there all kinds of ways that metaphorically we try to make locked doors, to try and make things more secure for us in our lives? I think of all kinds of different examples of things that give us pause, things that give us concern in life. And we say, boy, if I only do this or if I only do that, then I'll have a sense of security. I'll have a sense of security for my health. That not it possible that 
I rely on the locked doors of exercise and eating right. And if I do the right things and I do the, 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 the healthy things, that I'll stay healthy and I'll live longer. But is that any guarantee that I won't get the diagnosis of dementia or I won't get the diagnosis of cancer? I hide behind those locked doors and that sense of security of if I do this or that, things will be good, but... As our theme suggests, do those locked doors of Easter lock out fear and concerns that are in our lives? But I may have the concern, the fear, what's going to happen when I retire? Am I going to have any money left? Am I going to have enough money to live after I retire? And you rely, we rely behind, stand behind those locked doors. Well, I've got my 401k. I've got these investments. My house is paid for but are those locked doors, that sense of security that goes along with those locked doors, are they really that much security? I just think of in the last few weeks how one man, say a president of some country, says a few sentences about this or that subject and how stock markets can just drop like a rock in a matter of minutes, all because of a few words from one guy talking about something. The locked doors a sense of security, financial security, out the window. All kinds of reasons. And when it, when it comes right down to it, why is it? Why is it that we come up with these supposed locked doors and lock ourselves behind this, this sense of security, a false sense of security? It's because of sin. It's because of the sin around us, the world around us, because of my own sinful nature, the sinful decisions I make that give us the fear and the pause and the concern throughout our lives. And dear friends, isn't it true as Christians that you and I have just as much fear and care and concern, maybe more, than the unbelievers around us? Let's not think that we're immune from the cares and the concerns and the fears that go along with the sin and the consequences of sin in our lives. Dear friends, Easter does not remove those kinds of fears. But also, dear friends, when we talk about and think and consider the reality of those fears, doesn't Easter give us the means to cope and deal with those fears? We think of Easter Sunday. We think of Jesus and how he reacted to the women at the tomb. We think of Jesus specifically in our text and what he said to those disciples as they were cowering in that locked room somewhere in Jerusalem. Would I have said the first words out of my mouth to the disciples what Jesus had said after those friends, supposed friends, had just treated him the way that they did? If you had 11 friends treat you like that, what would you say the first time you saw those supposed friends? Would you say, peace be with you, dear friends, even though you ran out and ditched me? Peace be with you, dear friends, even though you denied me and betrayed me? Peace be with you, dear friends, even though you're cowering here in fear behind these supposed locked doors that are supposed to keep you safe? That's my sinful nature reacting to the negative circumstances around me. And we think of Easter's locked doors. And aren't we reminded of this peace and security and the love and the care and concern of our gracious God in spite of our sinful decisions, in spite of our sinful actions? That in spite of me and all that I do against my holy, gracious God, through the power of the Holy Spirit who creates faith in our hearts, isn't that when Jesus comes into your hearts and my hearts and says the exact same thing peace be with you. That we see the reality of our hearts and our lives. And you can look at our hearts and our lives and say, before faith is there, right, the doors to our hearts were absolutely locked. There is no way that on my own and by myself I would ever choose to say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior from sin. The doors to my heart are absolutely locked tight shut. But through that power of the Holy Spirit, we can look at these illogical truths, illogical comforts that come along with the Easter Sunday. 
and take all the comfort that we can get from those words of Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace. The forgiveness of our sins. That's the first and foremost peace that you and I could ever have. The peace of the forgiveness of our sins. And this is where we think of this, this security too. The security that comes along with how it is that we keep those doors of our hearts open to receive that, that blessing and the promise and the authority and power of God's holy word. That you and I need to be constantly reminded of this peace which is ours because Satan is going to come at us just, just like he did the disciples. He's going to say, well, what kind of security do you think you have, Christian? Do you think the good Lord is going to come at you like those disciples they said, do you realize what you've just done? Do you realize what kind of sinful life that you have? Satan is going to raise doubts in our minds. Doubts about that security of the peace of our forgiveness. You claim to be a Christian and yet you do that? You claim to love Jesus? But dear friends, just like with the disciples, just like Jesus showed himself so often in his three-year ministry, just like we see the confidence of the Old Testament prophets looking to and, and putting all confidence in the world and the security of the grace and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus very, very clearly addresses this care and concern that our, our sinful consciences and, and, and Satan come bring up before us again and again that we need that daily constant reminder of the peace and security that comes with this gospel of Jesus Christ. And we rely on the words, on the promise that Jesus himself gives us in John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid the peace and security that comes with the promises of God's holy gospel. So how many times have you been laying in bed and said, oh, did I lock the doors? Oh, did I close the garage door? You're not going to be able to fall asleep until you get up, go and check the door, okay, everything's good, okay, yeah, I forgot, ooh, good thing I got up. Give me that peace and security. Then you can go back to bed, sleep, hopefully get a good night's sleep. How about leaving town? That you're 50 miles down the road and you go, oh, did I shut the iron off? Did I unplug this? Did I undo that? Oh, not going to necessarily turn around and go back 50 miles or whatever, but I bet, I bet you've done this, that you've called and said, hey, dear neighbor, dear friend, would you check this for me? to give me that sense of security that I know the iron is unplugged, what have you. Dear friends, man, if we're that concerned about that kind of a sense of security, and if, it's that all, if that's all it takes for a sense of security, knowing that the iron is unplugged, how about the sense of security that comes with this peace that Jesus talks about? Again, we give all credit to our gracious God. It's God the Holy Spirit who opened that, that stone-cold heart of mine to receive this gift of faith. And it's our Savior, Jesus Christ, who breaks down those locked doors to remind us of that empty tomb and the forgiveness of our sins. So we look, we look at Easter's locked doors. And we realize that through this sinful life, there will be fears. Easter in and of itself does not remove all those fears and cares and concerns, but it certainly does. It certainly does give us the means and the ways in order to cope with that. Looking forward, looking ahead to our eternal home in heaven and those gates that have been opened through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand? Now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in faith through Christ Jesus. Amen. And let's join together in confessing that Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. It'll be up there on, your, on the screen for you or following along. I'm on page 10 of our service folder. Let's confess our Christian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated and we'll gather our thank offerings. you please stand for our prayers today? As is noted in the service folder, uh, joining with Betty Poofall and um, thanking God for, for 80 years of grace, 80 years of, of blessings received from God, 80 years of service to, to him and to the people around us, and then also uh, keeping in mind the, the family and friends of, of Delilah Planner. Uh, her funeral will be tomorrow. I'll share more of that to you uh, later. But let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, our Savior and Good Shepherd, at this time of worship, we ask and humbly expect you to hear and answer all our prayers. We ask that you strengthen each of us as we've gathered to hear your word and grow in your gospel. We thank you for this opportunity to join as a family of believers in your house of worship. Please continue to send your protecting angels into our lives and the lives of our families and friends. Dear Lord, it is easy for the cares and pleasures of this world to dominate our priorities. We ask that you preserve us in the middle of all temptations and that we see you as the source of everything we have and everything we are. Keep us humble and thankful as we look at all the blessings you so generously give us. Give us thankful and generous hearts as we give our blessings and wealth back to you through the earthly church so that your message of love and forgiveness can be spread to as many people as possible before you return for your final judgment. Gracious Lord, each and every birthday is a reminder of all the blessings that you have showered on us, both material and spiritual blessings. 
We come thanking you for the 80 years of grace with which you have blessed Betty Poufal. We thank you for all the service she has given to others through this, her family and our congregation. Please continue to guard and bless Betty and her family as they live to serve you and their neighbors. Almighty God, you bless each of us with a time of grace during which we have the opportunity to learn about Jesus and the forgiveness of our sins. Some of our times of grace are longer than others, but each one is only a blessing from you. Comfort and strengthen us all in the earthly loss of our loved ones, but especially this morning be with the Delilah Planner family. We are walking in the valley of the shadow of death right now, but please comfort and strengthen them with the promises of your grace and mercy. Use us all in this family of St. Paul's to encourage one another when, which comes only through your grace. Visit the hospitals and give hope to those who are suffering. Enter classrooms and give wisdom and understanding to teachers and students alike. Be with all those who govern our country and give them all the wisdom and courage to lead as you would have us live. We ask all these things, dear Jesus, because you have also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I'll continue with our liturgy, our communion liturgy, again up on the screen, or page 11, page 11 of our service folder. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms and placed all things under his feet for the benefit of the church. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ on the same night that he was betrayed took bread and after he gave thanks he broke that bread giving it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then Jesus also took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all your sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please be seated. We have now invited and encouraged all those confirmed members of our congregation here at St. Paul's or of our sister congregations of the Wisconsin Synod to follow the direction of our ushers and receive God's grace through Jesus' body and blood. Would you please stand? We'll conclude our service this morning. I'm on page 14 of the service folder. And let's join together in singing the section called Thank the Lord. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. sing our final hymn here. We go back to the first hymn we sang, hymn 250, but now let's sing verse 2. <laughs> 